Something every gamer with multiple consoles has to deal with is the challenge of getting everything hooked up and having it all somehow connected to a single TV. Talk about living the dream. Ideally, you don't want to have to be swapping cables around. I've heard of retro gamers that have nightmares about this sort of thing. Plus, the inputs are usually in the back of the TV, out of sight and out of reach. You could earn yourself a trip to the hospital trying to maneuver yourself back into there. Some people hate swapping cables so so much that once they run out of inputs on their TV, they just say, well, I guess I can't have any more consoles. Either that or they just have consoles packed away in storage. But that's not fair to your console. The punishment doesn't fit the crime. It just needs to be plugged in. It's not your console's fault there aren't enough inputs to go around. So what are we to do? Well, if you're a maniac, I suppose you could just have a separate TV for each of your consoles, assuming you have a room large enough to fit them and live with people who can somehow tolerate it. But what if you don't have a ton of TVs? What if you have a more normal amount of TVs, like one? What do you do now? Well, most TVs do generally have multiple sets of inputs on them, but it just never seems to be enough. It's almost like whoever was deciding how many inputs these TVs would have didn't think people would be hanging on to decades worth of consoles and want them all plugged in at once. Come on, they should have known. See, while most non-gamers will show their TV input panel mercy by only plugging in maybe a TV signal and something like a DVD player, us retro gamers go for total domination of these things. If there's an empty input, there's probably something we can plug in there. You may notice that larger TVs tend to have more inputs on them than smaller TVs. Do people with bigger TVs tend to have more devices hooked up to them? What if you have a small TV and want to load that sucker up? I think it must have more to do with marketing. Having those extra inputs on the back of your TV is just so premium. When somebody chooses a bigger TV and gets four inputs on the back instead of three, they're thinking, oh yeah, wait till the Johnsons next door hear about this, I'll be that envy of the neighborhood. The thing is, regardless of how many inputs your TV has, there's a good chance you'll still need more, and especially if there's a certain type of connection you need. Let's say you have three consoles to hook up, but you want them all hooked up via component, or old green, blue, and red as some people like to call it. Well, enter the most common solution for adding inputs being video selectors, video switch boxes, switchers, or whatever you like to call them. You just plug in all your cables to the switch box, plug the switch switch box into the input on your TV and boom, you are in business, my friend. But hold your horses there because not all switch boxes are made equally. Great news, right? So does that mean somebody might say your particular switch box is a piece of crap? You betcha. Like most equipment, there's almost no limit to how much money you can pour into it and almost no limit to how far people will go to scrutinize the quality of said equipment. I suppose it just depends how much the quality matters to you and how much you can discern it. The more expensive the equipment, the better it should be in theory, but ultimately it's going to come down to hooking up that equipment with your personal setup and seeing if it looks good enough to you. For example, I use some pretty cheap stuff myself. One of the biggest reasons for that is when I bought all this stuff years ago, it's pretty much all that was really available. If there was more expensive stuff back then, apparently I wasn't able to find it. It wasn't until retro gaming had gained enough steam and video quality received more of an emphasis that I started to see higher quality, more expensive options pop up. Naturally, these products are all marketed towards retro gamers since we're the ones with the need for them, with perhaps the rare exception of some oddball who wants to hook up eight VCRs in a karaoke machine. Back to the cheap crap I own though. Now, from my understanding a video selector cannot improve a signal, the goal is to simply not degrade the quality in any way, whether it be the video, sound, or perhaps even input delay or something nasty like that. Well, as a little experiment, multiple times I've tried switching back and forth between having one of my connections plugged directly in and having it plugged into the switch box. And I just cannot tell a difference. I'm not saying that means there isn't a difference, but if there is, I personally cannot tell. 
Now, maybe I got lucky, or maybe that means some people will think I'm a jack wagon, but I don't really care because I'm happy with it. I got bigger problems to deal with, like my recipe for ketchup water. It came out bad last time, but I am telling you, I'm this close to getting it right. I just think most people have enough problems in their life that they can see that they don't need to also be looking for problems they can't see. That all being said, people have reported there are differences amongst the cheap crappy switch boxes, and it makes sense that it would be a bigger roll of the dice when using cheaper stuff. For example, I've heard bad things about these particular SCART switchers that have a cable built into them. Of course, if you do want to use the more expensive switch boxes, I don't see anything wrong with that, especially if you can notice a difference and maybe just because they tend to come with a larger number of inputs. It doesn't make you an elitist either. It only makes you an elitist if you're a jerk to other people about it. Again, I'm closer than any of you to perfecting a recipe for ketchup water and you don't see me trying to make you feel bad about it. But as far as choosing a video selector goes, here are some of the main things to consider besides price. Obviously, what kind of connections are available on it, and keep in mind that video selectors generally don't convert signals, meaning that whatever you put into it is what it will put out. For example, if you feed S video into this selector, you need to have S video going out of the selector into the TV. You cannot just magically have it go out through component. So all you sneaky dogs trying to pull a fast one won't be able to. One notable exception, however, if you want to downgrade your S video into composite, that will actually work. Not sure why you'd want to do that, but you can. And selectors do often have multiple outputs to accommodate whatever kind of signal you're putting into it. You'll also want to pay attention to how many inputs it can accommodate, of course, with the largest ones that you can find typically being about eight. Another thing to consider is whether or not the video selector has a power cable that needs to be plugged in. Having a power supply should help lessen any potential quality degradation. Of course, the cheap switch boxes I have don't use power supplies, and I wasn't able to notice a difference, but again, that's just me. The other thing you'll want to keep in mind if your switch box has a power cord is that, you guessed it, that power cord needs to be plugged in. Ah, your old nemesis, the power outlet. With so many consoles to plug in, there's never enough of these to go around, are there? Also, is it just me or does a power outlet look like two little faces? It's like, what are you two little fellows up to? Whatever, stab you in the eyes with a power cord. Of course, I'm sure most of you are well familiar with these suckers, surge protectors. These will protect your devices from surges, but perhaps more importantly, they will allow you to plug more crap into a single outlet. And yet, no matter how many of these suckers you have, it's never enough. Plugging cords into these generally isn't too much trouble, but then the Sega Genesis power bricks crash the party and say, hold my energy drink, I know how to make this complicated. In theory, the surge protectors that orient the plug sideways should make things easier, but check out this trick I came up with. That's right, no plugs to block now, you bulky jerks. With all these video, audio, and power cables hooked up, and goodness forbid anything else you want to have plugged in, like, oh, I don't know, lights? Naturally, cable management is going to be a factor too. After all, what would a multiple console setup be without a jungle of cords? Typically, this can be resolved easily enough by just keeping them all behind your TV or whatever your TV is resting on, but you may still have some cords that are out in the open. For these, I would actually suggest cable wraps. They're cheap and can be purchased online. That description is usually enough to get people on board with something. For the ones I have, you just wrap the cable around and zip it up. Easy to use and makes things a lot tidier, I'd say. All right, and now it's time for my I like to talk about the Game Boy segment. Speaking of which, how about that Game Boy? When it comes to handhelds in general, it's kind of nice that we get a little break from having to hook them up to a TV. It's all just self-contained in a nice little package. But I think that about does it for the advice I can give. As always, I'd like to hear from all of you. In particular, what is the one thing you find to be most annoying about hooking up multiple consoles? For me personally, it would be finding a spot for consoles so that their cables can reach the inputs that they need to get to. It seems like there's always a problem whenever I move something. But with that said, let's hear from all of you in the comments and I will see ya in the next video. The red bird, yeah, and he's talking, talking about.
Stop with me.